Hey guys, just letting you know on Saturday, May 6th, I'm doing a live podcast in Chicago, Illinois at Brick a Brack Records in Logan Square, just two blocks down from the AAW show that's happening that night. The show is free. Come and enjoy yourself. But for now, enjoy this week's show. This is the Art of Wrestling with professional wrestler Colt Cabana. How you guys doing? Come on in, sit down, relax. You're about to listen to the Art of Wrestling, professional wrestling podcast. It's a live podcast. It's a personal journal. It's an entryway into the minds, the souls, the hearts, and the lives of the people involved in the world of professional wrestling. I am your host. My name is Colt Cabana. I, uh, I'm an entertainer. I'm a podcaster. I'm an, uh, I'm an entrepreneur of some sorts. Most importantly, though, I am a professional wrestler, and I am sitting here live in my studio apartment in Chicago, Illinois. Before I go any further, this is a fan-supported and listener-supported podcast, supported by people just like you. Give it to you free of charge every single Thursday. ColtCommanda.com, iTunes, SoundCloud, wherever you get your podcasts from. A couple great ways that you can support, rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes. Tell a friend, tweet it out, let somebody know. Best way that you can support, though, ColtMerch.com, DigitalColt.com, t-shirts, buttons, pictures, posters, DVDs, digital downloads, premium podcasts, The Wrestling Road Diaries 3, I got buttons, I got micro brawlers, I got headbands. I got it all. ColtMerch.com, DigitalColt.com. Caprice Coleman is on the show today, and uh, I'm very excited about having Caprice on. He's been wrestling a very long time. He's just kind of recently started. I, we'll get into it. We'll get into it. It's good to hear. And he's got a good story. A man of the faith. A man of the faith or a man of faith? One of those. And that's always fun to have. He's a preacher. The guy's a preacher. And I'm a bar mitzvah boy from the suburbs of Chicago. I mean, we don't get into some kind of clash, but it's the idea that we're all working together as one. We all have love for each other. And uh, the, the big bond here, right? I think we're two different people. The big bond here is wrestling. And that's why we're friends, Caprice and I. Wrestling has brought us together. Has brought us to this podcast. Has brought you to this podcast. Has helped build a community of uh, misfits weirdos, nerds, dweebs, whoever it is, all of us, all of us fucking oddballs together. And this is a, this is a good example of it. I, uh, I was in Arizona this week. I've been taking in the good weather. I was in Clearwater, Florida last week, sitting on the beach, sitting at the pool, getting a tan, went to Arizona this week, hung out with my parents. My mom turned 71. Happy birthday, Mrs. Cabana. I know there was a guy that tweeted me that said he was doing, or a girl, I forget. I think it was a guy, though, that tweeted me and said they were doing a paper on myself, Stone Cold Steve Austin, and The Rock, to which my reply was, two of those have made millions of dollars and one is getting dropped off at their wrestling show by their mother. And that's exactly what happened. That's where they winter. They winter in Arizona. And now, hopefully, I wrestle in Arizona. I did. I wrestled at Party Hard Wrestling. It was a lot of fun. I had a really good time. Kikutaro joined me. We had a tag team match. We did a spot based off of the United Airlines debacle that had happened. I dragged a member of the Brother Club out of the ring along with Kikutaro. The wrestling match it had been overbooked. Get it? That's a little comedy in wrestling for you. <laughs> Topical also. I kept on looking over at my parents to see if they got any of it. And afterwards, they said they did. But in the moment, they just had the biggest blank stares on their eyes watching their son do what he does for a living. No shame for me, but I'm sure they're like, what the fuck? It was also in this like Mesa, Arizona rock club that I love. But I don't know if it was exactly for them. But I enjoyed watching them, watching me have a wrestling match. Oh, as for me, I don't know if you can tell in my voice, I'm a little bummed out. I've been, uh, uh stuff I don't even want to talk about, stuff I haven't really even talked about, and I, don't, I, I, I will eventually, maybe, I don't know, still, uh, I, you know, talking with my lawyers today, that's an ongoing thing, I'm still in this lawsuit, it's been, I think, over two years now, and uh, it's adding up in every way, it's very hard, it's very hard. And I don't know if anyone's kind of ever dealt with this stuff, but you do it and then you get totally down and then you forget about it. And then you're just having the time of your life and you're enjoying yourself and you're laughing, and you're smiling. And you're like, everything's great. Life is good. And then you get a call and you get an update about stuff. And then you're like, oh yeah, this is something that weighs on me every single day and will affect the rest of my life. So that's where I'm at. I can't really go much into it. I wish I could. But if you're, uh, if you're feeling for me, 
you know, it was done because of a podcast. So all I ask is that you continue to listen, tell a friend, and hopefully we uh, gain a good audience here and it was all worth it. You know, that's what I say. Make it worth it. Not sure if it was, but we will move forward. I, I, I think you're going to enjoy this talk with Caprice. He is such an excellent talker. Uh, in this podcast, but just when I watch him do Ring of Honor stuff and when I see him on the microphone, he's so, so, he's so, I was going to say, he's so good talking. That's what I was going to say. He's so good talking that it's easy to gain a good appreciation for him. We do have a song of the week, and I'm going to do a repeat this week. Buffalo, Buffalo. Last week they were on with a Dusty song, and it was wonderful. And I got so much fun feedback and I hope you guys reached out to them. They got an Instagram, Buffalo Buffalo Music. You can buy their album, Buffalo Times Two dot Bandcamp dot com. That's Buffalo X Two. And I'm gonna play this song in honor of me being at Cape Wrestling on Saturday in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Missouri. That's where Bob Orton was once on the Athletic Commission, and he had this bullshit job where he was the one giving me my wrestling license at Gateway Championship Wrestling in St. Louis. So here it is. The song, Cowboy Bob Orton by Buffalo Buffalo. Enjoy it. We'll be back with Caprice Coleman. Had that cast on for so long now. Angel bones are getting strong. But they will never love you. They will never love you. At your best, your second rate. My older brother thinks you're great. But they So as we sit here and do this podcast, I'm rooming with Caprice Coleman, and Caprice, you were, you were doing. Do you have a you have a routine? Is that correct? I don't know. Did Did you notice a routine with me? Oh, let's throw that up to your mouth. Okay. Yeah, I know you're familiar with a microphone. Well, you you I mean you just gave me a speech of uh, God. It's gonna know when you're gone. Yeah. Uh, you what is it? You want to look good while you're here, or you just you, no? I I, I really got to keep the that, vessel good, right? Yeah, I feel like. Uh, when we're born, God already knows, like you know, how long we're gonna be here. But it's up to us to whether we live life comfortably or not. As far as keeping care of our bodies uh, and stuff like that, a lot of people, you know, when they get older, they're either gonna be hurt and crippled up, or you know, out of shape, and they live a hard life, or they could stay in shape and take care of themselves. And the longer they're here, they're still comfortable. So, uh, is there any vanity to you? Uh, Do you know what I say by that? Not, not really. Like, are you trying to look good so you can look good, or are you literally like, I'm, I'm, I'm looking, I'm doing all of this so when I'm seventy, I'm fine. You know, a little bit of both. <laughs> I, I feel, I feel there's any time any wrestler's vanity in us. You know, it's got to be something in us that makes us uh, vain in some type of way. Uh, I also feel that I've been given a lot of mentors in life that are a lot older than I am that have shown me that if you continue to take care of your body, your body will take care of you. So I just kind of do what they do. And uh, who are these people? Oh man, I have. Like, do you know like eighty year old Jack dudes? I wouldn't say eighty. I do have an eighty six year old deacon uh, at my church, and uh, he's eighty six years old. He still tends the horses. He mows lawns. He works on tractors. He gets up every morning. He calls me like once a week to check on me. He's 86 years old. He's checking on me. Walk up and down stairs. He goes to every, visits people and all. 86 years old. And you don't see, like, there's no signs of him slowing down, really. Like I've known him since I was a kid, and he's been the same person ever since. I'm sure he has his his own stuff he deals with. Of course. But I've, I've never, he's never been in a hospital that I know of, uh, like, laid up like that. And he's always been the one to visit people in the hospital. And you can picture him 
95 just being safe. Absolutely. Being, yeah. Absolutely. And as he says, he it gives it to the grace of God, but I believe it's also because he stays very active. He's like, he mows the church lawn. He mows like uh, older ladies in the church whose, whose husbands have passed and stuff. He'll mow their lawn and stuff like that. I mean, he just that's what he does. Okay, so to give everyone a little context, because we'll talk about uh, you as a wrestler, but I do know you like you're a man of God, and I know that's a big part of your history. Um, not that... I don't know how much you want to. I don't want to get into like religion talk, but I want to do get in talk about your path. I'm, I'm comfortable, with whatever. I know, but I don't know if I do. <laughs> how deep you want to uh, go? <laughs> uh, you've been wrestling a long time, now. twenty years, has yeah, been, at least twenty years, yeah, twenty years on the uh, dot. Uh, I want to say I started when I was 18. I'll be 40 in March, so probably 22. A little bit more yeah, than that. Yeah, a little more 20. You've yeah. literally been around forever. Yeah, no? I, have, I have. And I'm still pretty. No. Yeah, you are, man. You look better than me. That's for fucking sure. I don't know how old you are, though, but I remember you just about as long as I remember myself because uh, when I first started Ring of Honor, I think you were one of my first opponents. Uh, yeah, we but also like, that which was 2010 or 11. No, no, no. I'm talking about like 2000. That's what like I was talking about. Do or die in New Jersey. Oh, we were I was talking too. about the, at the Rexplex. Yeah, the, yeah. Were we in a four way together? Uh, no, it was me and you. And then after you, I think you beat two guys and then you wrestled me. And you had this pinning combination that nobody could get out of. Yeah, that was a, that was that was, that was a Rubik's a new, cube of yeah. professional wrestling. Yeah, that was man. That was like 2000. Four, maybe. That did Two not times? get over. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it beat me, I'll say that. Have you bro. ever had stuff that you were like married to that you just couldn't get over? That you, yes, the, the heart punch. The heart punch. Yes. Do you remember the heart punch? Of course. Probably don't. But, it does. No, I don't <laughs> but yeah, I, it gets over huge on like in indie crowds. It gets over huge, but I couldn't get it over here. So it's like. Oh, you it tried it here? I did. I tried it a couple of times. Some people kind of got it. I think you have to be like a Bruce Lee fan to get it. Uh, and I was going to say, I think, like, you have to be bo- I think you have to have been watching wrestling in 1970. Well, and Ox Baker. I got it. I got it from the Ox Baker has the heart punch. I had the one inch punch. Yeah, from from Bruce Lee, and I actually uh, got, I got it from a one my inch dad. Something too. Yeah. <laughs> nothing to brag about. I got it from my dad. He was he was really big into martial arts and all that, and um, he could do it and send me from here all the way across the room. Yeah, because you think that's bullshit, right? And he man, I could do it, and I could I could knock you pretty good distance, but he could like knock me off my feet. Oh, can we do it? Can you rem- remind me? We'll do a YouTube thing afterwards. Sure. Of you rocking my world, <laughs> <laughs> flying into the hotel wall. It's like it's really just basically like a, a body sh- a body weight shift, uh, but it's it works. Mm-hmm. It works, mm-hmm. but it's uh, not gonna like you know kill you or anything. So you've been <laughs> wrestling uh, since ninety six. What was the yeah ninety six? Yeah ninety six. And, and you know we were on a show and, and Chris Daniels like that Ring of Honor pay per view that we did. Uh, the whole thing was like Chris Daniels been wrestling since ninety three, and you just think about the way. Here we are, 2017. You think about the way that just wrestling's changed. Yeah. And like we're in the same it's not like we've both gone on to become these huge like gods of wrestling and now can look back on it. It's like we're in the same spot. Right. I understand. Right? Yeah. 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 So you know, I, I I don't know if you've had thoughts of like ninety seven nineteen ninety seven wrestling compared to two thousand seventeen wrestling or Oh man. If it, you really think about it, right? It's a total different uh genre now. Um Actually, back then I was I was the cheeseburger, you know. Were I was, you a stick? I, I was. I probably weighed a hundred and sixty something pounds. I was. I mean, I was bigger framed than cheeseburger, but everybody was so big back mm-hmm. then, you know. I was the small guy, and now like I fit in with everybody else, and <laughs> I'm right at around two hundred pounds. But everybody yeah. was like two forty, two thirty, and back then and now there's a lot of uh, guys aren't as big as they used to be, and everybody like I was one of the you know I was trained with Matt and Jeff, and so we were like American high flyers, you know we got a lot of our stuff from luchadors in Mexico and all that. So when we go to shows, everybody was still doing basic clothesline, elbow drop, leg drop, and all that, and, and we were the only ones. And I want to stop that because that's what that scene was. Yeah. In 97, yeah. 98, 99. And, and we were crazy. They were, we were the spot monkeys. Yeah. You know, and I didn't meet anybody like me until I went down to uh, Cornelia, Georgia with Bill Barons and AJ Styles. And um, and then I met more people like me, which forced me to change into more of a persona to where I had to figure out what makes me different than an athletic person. Right, because at first, <laughs> nobody's doing. Kind of, right. What was, what was like the first flying thing that you thought was crazy that you did? Or you moonsault. Tried, or you tried in practice a moonsault? Moonsault. <laughs> and actually, it was a springboard moonsault. And uh, it was Matt Hardy's finishing move. He called it the megahertz. Yeah. He was high voltage at the time. And I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. And um, so I would try it at practice. And he was like, well, you know you can't do this in a match. I'm like, I know. I, I just like it. You know. And so uh, that was that was a huge thing to me. 
You were and you were were you practicing in the barn? Were you trained by those guys? Yeah. Like, yeah. We know. didn't have a barn. We we had a ring at uh one of the other wrestlers' house. Actually, Trevor Lee's dad, his name is Tracy Cadell. Um his dad had the ring in his house and we would come there every Sunday and train in vast North Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Uh, and the, and the Hardys were the Hardys at that point. Oh, ninety seven. Yeah, they must have been. They were no. They were they were breaking it. Actually, they were they were every once in a while they were doing like job jobs for the mm-hmm. WWE and all. But they were like uh, high voltage and will o' the wisp. So when they started showing up on TV and they became these megastars, were you guys like, what's going? No, we kind of we well, uh, there's a whole lot behind that. But when we when it first started, we kind of was like, okay, good, what's going to happen? And then. Us not knowing the business, we thought we were, you were going next. to be the next You're WWE. Next. Well, not not next to WWE. We thought we were like next to WWE because Omega was really taking off. Oh, you know. So we thought like you know, eventually we would be WCW, then w, you know, yeah. or whatever like that, and then um, WWE picked them up where we were happy for them because like it the was. Idea. I thought I like the idea of them like well. I guess you just go to Trevor Lee's dad, you train a little, and then you go to WWE. That's how it works. <laughs> well, we actually, like, uh, because of the fo- the fan following that Omega had uh, got, we thought we were the next big thing. Right. Y- you know, and so, actually, for me, uh, I wasn't looking at WWE or whatever like that. Um, I was looking to be a Omega champion one day. Mm-hmm. You know, that was my goal. And then when people started dispersing and all, I mean, Shannon Moore, we went down to uh, NDBA Wildside. And you became a fixture of that. Scene. Yeah, yeah. And you were probably, you know, for some people um, listening, you were probably that guy. Like, there's people, random people that I watched in, on Windy City Wrestling that are like, I'm a fan of, and they, I probably, you know, they probably work at the, yeah, at the Jewel next door. Right, 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 right. <laughs> but right. you know, because that was syndicated for so many years, mm-hmm. and you were a fixture on that syndicated show yeah. all over the country. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. I was actually in a barber shop uh, back home, and. And somebody was like, man, I was watching you in California. And I was like, cool, we did that in the barn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's also weird, the power of just, of just, even today, although it is changing, obviously. And this might take another 25, 30 years, but the power of television, mm-hmm. where the people, the difference of just being on a television, yeah. even if you're in a shitty little barn, and yeah. Cornelia, Georgia, yeah. Or whatever, yeah. Yeah. you're like a TV star. Yeah. You're on it, and it changes the perception of how people think and view you. <laughs> Absolutely, it does. And even when I did my tryouts or whatever you call them at WWE, like people already knew who I was there. Oh, the wrestlers. Yeah, like some yeah. of the wrestlers. And it was weird because they were kind of like, oh, crap, he's here. <laughs> you know, so, but uh, for the most part, it was like, you know, they knew who I was. They, they got me and all. So I didn't have to really do as much as I guess other people did because people already knew me. So some of the stars would request to work me because they already knew that I could work and make them look did good. Did you I do guess. a lot of those matches? Yeah, I did. I, <laughs> uh, I did. You should I see did. his face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was actually thinking one day, you know, oh, I'm, it's going to happen. But And what do you attribute that to? Do you ever think about that? I mean, think about I, I don't know. The idea that you do all those matches and just uh, does it ever come close? Did anyone ever have, hey, hey, may, did, did Johnny Laurinaitis ever say, hey, maybe do oh, man. this? Or? I was, I was, okay, uh, that's gonna set a whole nother a direction of this podcast, but um, I've plenty of times they would say, "Hey, you know, this is great, da 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 da," and they bring me back, bring me back. Uh, I was in the office with John Laurinaitis, and it, it kind of went like, you know, "Hey, you're a clean cut guy of color. I think it would be better if maybe you was a rapper." Oh God! Or maybe yeah, something. It's, everything he said was so like, and I said, "Well, I'm actually a pastor." Well, could you be like a pastor that goes out and judge people? Like everything was so like stereotypical. I was like, you know what? I'm no, I can't do that. What a bad I taste wanna, in your I, mouth, yeah, I want to huh? be. I want to be me. I'm actually really good. I can speak for myself. I'm really athletic. Oh yeah, I'll get back to you on that. This is good. I mean, but hey, if you think about it, and then like. Not even a year later, crime times on TV. Right. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. And that, um, but does that be like, I never want to, well, I, this is not a place I want to work, or is that like, maybe, God, if I could just change the way that they have these perceptions, or, well, or like, I, I'd like to be there, but not do that thing? Absolutely. I wanted to be there, but I, I they call it, I mean, on my side, they call it like selling out. I didn't want to try to be something that I wasn't mm-hmm. and that I didn't approve of. You know, and so my goal was to try to be a person that people 
when they saw me, they got me. They, if I was allowed to talk, they would understand who I am. Um, however, in their 90s uh, or whatever, not to pull the race car, but they had certain places for certain people. Yeah. And so they had the black athletic guy. They had the black big guy. And that was the role. You could be Caucasian and there was plenty of roles for them, but it was only a few roles for us. So in a way, it made us kind of uh, face each other. You know, mm -hmm. if you was black, it's kind of like I'm gonna be the black guy. No, I'm gonna be the athletic, but you know, uh, or you whatever. For that yeah, you fight for that spots, one, one right? or two spots. Absolutely, yeah. and there was only one or two spots for us. And now I believe uh, the the world is changing where they actually believe me and Kenny King are two different people. You believe that? Oh, and so, and so, uh, uh, I b I believe I'm blessed to have stayed in the business long enough to see that day come right. to pass but it, it just wasn't there for well, who was like maybe day. one that didn't like the first pe person that i think of then would be shelton benjamin because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. he was just kind of a dude yeah and so, uh actually like uh shelton and i are great friends but um when i was trying to get on he was he was young and all and it was kind of like we already have one of you yo, the, that's the, and and he was we have the normal black yeah, guy spot. and and he was like he at that time he was 50 pounds more than i could yeah. and he could do the exact same stuff right you know they just wouldn't give him a microphone at the time until he got better and yeah. i was like i could do this but it was like we already had that spot full yeah. you know and he did, i couldn't look at Sheldon and be like, i'm better than get that guy no he was great <laughs> <laughs> you know but i hated that that's all they saw me as was an athletic black guy. Yeah, you know, I don't. Not that I could put myself in your in your shoes at all. Mm, I understand. But when I go into those meetings, like I'm thinking, well, what do I have to offer? I'm just a normal white guy, and like that's like I pitched the Jewish thing mm -hmm. because it's like, well, they don't have it. Like, and 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 thinking of like right the stereotypes like, that they want to fill, like, well, they don't have a Jewish guy. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, yeah. well, I you know, I that's and that's how. It's weird because for years before that, I was wrestling as just a wrestler on the indies and successful. Yeah. But then once you get to that machine, yeah. it's like, well, what role don't they have and what can I fill? And, and, the, thing, and the thing about and it I is, was willing to sell out. <laughs> yeah, well, I understand that. But, but and then, too, I guess they looked at it like the Jew is real touchy because you don't want to offend. And, you right. don't, da, 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 da. and when you think about it, it is a legit machine. They have places they put things and they push it a certain way to make you feel a certain way about it. And... Uh, that's just the way they've yeah, drilled. Well, is the nation of domination touchy? Is that? I mean, I feel that stuff is all kind of touchy. Oh, I'm, I'll put it like this. I think everything's I touchy. I would put it like this: the nation of domination w was touchy uh, at the time. However, you have the NWO and you have the Four Horsemen, and you have all these uh, mega factions, the Free Birds that were back in the day, that can be relived at the drop of a dime, at the snap of a finger, where people can imitate them, imitate the same signals, and nobody calls them out on it. However, you put three black people in the same group, nation of domination. <laughs> Immediately. Yeah. So, I mean, hey, that's the business. <laughs> right. Um, okay, well, let's let's start from a little earlier. Where you Are you from North Carolina? Yeah. I was born in New York, but I, I moved from New York when I was like three years old. My parents split or whatever, so I've been raised in North Carolina. By your? By my mother. Your mother. And then my mother remarried when I was 12 uh, to my stepdad. He passed uh, like four years ago. Sorry, dude. Uh, it's all May. He's he was a great guy and all his better place. Uh, and, all, and actually, like, uh, through Ring of Honor, I can say I rekindled the relationship with my biological father. Because you went up through, through New Jersey. Yep. Okay. And uh, I actually, short story on that, I called him and let him know I was going to be there. And, of course, he was like, I was going to be there. I didn't believe it. He was there, brought my aunts and uncles and all that. And ever since then, we've had a tight relationship. He was in New York last week with us, and he comes to all the shows oh, nice. up there. Yeah. And I met my brother last year. He comes to all the shows now. So it's pretty awesome. And so uh, was it just you and your mom growing up? Uh, my it was or and your step. Uh, it, was, it was until I was twelve. It was my mom, uh, my brother, and my sister. Okay, uh, or whatever. And then um, my mom remarried when I was twelve um, to and, to my stepdad. And where does uh, where does and what kind of household or what kind of area did you live in? What kind of? Well, we lived in T Town, North Carolina. It was the, I I don't know what to call it. it was you know predominantly black neighborhood um, or whatever. We weren't rich. You know, uh, we grew up a lot uh, of government assistance, yeah. you know, um, and all. And, and my mom did the best she could working two or three jobs uh, the best she could. She worked very hard and her work ethic uh, showed me that, you know, you're not going to make it unless you unless you work. You got to work for whatever you get. Have you always been a, a nice guy? Ah. Do you ever have a streak of uh, 
rebellion? I did. I, I, I mean, I've always had... You're such a, a sweetheart, man, you know? And I think everyone knows that. I think I've always had a conscience because I was raised in the church. Yeah. But then I moved out on my own when I was 18 years old, and there was a time where I was like, I want to try this. I want to try that. I want to try this. I never, like, left the church, and which I think was a bad thing because I was trying this stuff and I was still going to church but then after a while I was like you know what it's gonna be church or this thing here and I just kind of left it alone so like because I knew better would you you had a a three-month streak of I don't know how time you know what it, it, I can't that's a whole other story too because yeah. I could say oh it was three months of this three months of that but then when you dibble and dabble with something some things take longer than leave than others even though you want to leave them alone they don't leave they Can don't I ask leave what you were man. dibbling and dabbling or oh just- man I, I wasn't I wasn't really into you know drinking uh drugs and all you know my 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 thing has always been like women you know women. just always always been women even even uh now I like my wife knows she's like you know we we have a tight bond uh and all that and I, I told her and she's worked with me on it and we have a great relationship uh for that see i this is something i can kind of relate to in the sense of i don't right i don't do drink i don't do drinks i don't do i don't do drugs i don't drink you know that mm-hmm. the stuff that alters your mind mm-hmm. but you kind of say, well you know sex and women doesn't i mean i guess there is that euphoria from sex and stuff but it's not like you know what you're doing. You know what you like. Yeah, you're conscious about it. Um, and it's not like hurting your brain. I don't think. Maybe yeah, a different level. Yeah, there's a that. And um, I understand you. And there's a spiritual side to it, to where where it got me. Um, to where it's like you know, once you are in contact with somebody, you kind you kind of never really leave contact. Uh, with that person, there's a whole lot of in depths in that that I had to go through. Uh, and all, and actually, you know, not trying to preach, God has allowed me to run cross paths with a lot of people in my past and apologize. Uh, for things because you know I, I did some messed up stuff yeah, yeah. you know when I was young or whatever and then for me to you know become a pastor I hated the feeling that you know I could be on the pulpit or on TV one day preaching and then somebody that I've you know played over turns on the TV I'm like yeah right this guy you know what mm-hmm, I mean mm-hmm. and so God has allowed me to 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 run cross paths with a lot of the people of my past to show them who I am now and to really like I guess close the bridge uh, on there and to um, to, to where it's, it's people yeah I'd imagine it. people a, a pastor even a politician mm-hmm. or whatever like that's there's that one thing that like you gotta close that yeah gap. you got Other, to it wait, even right you're preaching to a million people but in your head like there, there's that one person that weighs on you yeah it's guilty conscious I've my, had it my father-in-law he uh, he he He's really like a guy that reminds me of that because um, there's a pastor friend that he has that he grew up with. And they they grew up, they were running buddies. They did everything together. Now he's a pastor. And every time he talks about him, he's like, well, they call him Pastor so-and-so, but I call him Sammy Quick. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Because he knows his past. And I was like, shitty man. Shitty Bob. We know, about, yeah, we know I know Bob. I, you know him by so-and-so, <laughs> but I know him by Jive Turkey. Right. You know? And so it reminds me that some people are never going to forget who you are. Yeah. You know, but if you have a chance to show them who you've become, then maybe that's impactful to them as well. Because even though they know who you were and they see who you become, they see that they could change as well. Right, right. Uh, where does wrestling come in? Uh, that's a funny story. I remember when I was three years old, I was watching TV. And Dusty Rhodes was on TV. Mm-hmm. He was the first wrestler I ever saw. And it was the storyline, him and Barry Windham with the devil in the boot storyline. And ever since I had to find out if there was a devil in that boot, or you know, that <laughs> I was I was intrigued. And then after that, like I said, at the three ch- years old. The church, that's so funny that the church comes into this. Yeah. And so I was like, man, what's going on with this boot thing? And da 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 and so uh, I was intrigued in that. And like I said, after three, my, my parents had separated. So wrestlers kind of were like my father figures mm-hmm. in a way. You know how I kind of looked at them as like, this is what a man is mm-hmm. type thing. So that's what I kind of grew up on watching. And then it just kind of, I went from watching them as a hero to when Brian Pillman, Juice and Lung, Juice and Liger and uh, the cruiserweight division to being like, I could be one of these A guys. reality. Yeah. Wow. That's the. F- so did you... Um, I want to say my buddy Marty DeRosa always kind of says this like he would be like oh that guy would be a great dad like did you would you watch the wrestlers and be like oh or like no. or, or fantasize about like them being your father I can't I can't I can't remember any wrestler that I was like you know uh, he would be a great father I think I just looked at them as like I could be like him okay. and then 
as growing up, I was always the smallest kid in my class and all that. So I kind of like learned self defense through wrestling or whatever. So I would always know moves. So when when the bullies would pick on me, I was able to get them in a the headlock or yeah, a lock I, on a you know. It was I felt like that helped me too. Yeah, is yeah. It like and I and it really worked. Like yeah. the moves really worked. So. Uh, it got me through school, and then I, I wrestled through high school, like legit wrestled, and I added to my repertoire, then MMA and all that stuff. So it, it's just martial arts. And um, Did you uh, do combat. all that stuff? Did you do yeah. uh, amateur wrestling like with the idea of like one day being a professional wrestler? Or? I did amateur wrestling because of pro wrestling. Right. You know, and it was funny because, you know, when I tried out for the team, <laughs> I had my name and everything. I just and they was like, no, it's. I was looking for the ring and it was a mat and I was like, what is this? What was your name? Uh, Ice. Ice. Uh, it's always been Ice, you know. And uh, it, it, that's a long story behind that. But I just, you know, when they they said wrestling team, trying out for the wrestling team in high school, I was like, word, I'm gonna try out for the wrestling team. And I went in first day of practice. I was looking for the ring, yeah. man, and it was a mat. And I was like, what is this? And they was tumbling around and all that stuff and. uh I was hooked though. Once, once I like learned the fundamentals and all that, like you, you couldn't get me off that mat. I was, I was hooked. Did you do well? In the- I did. I had about seven fifty record. So I let me. Uh, I, I would win seventy five percent of my nice. matches. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, what was it like losing amateur wrestling? It's, and it's, it's not it's something I never did. No, I was lost as a team. I was, I was always yeah. on team sports. Yeah, uh, it is. It's, it's something that um, the advantage and disadvantage is. Was well, it's kind of a twice advantage because you could your team could lose, but if you won your match, you could be like, they lost, but I won my match. Right. You could lose your match, but if your team won, you could be like, "Oh yeah, we won. Still yeah. <laughs> we, we won." But if you if you a guy just dominates you, like mm-hmm. right, that's kind of like just he's physically dominating you. Yeah, it's a and it's you're a, a loser. Yeah, it's it's a game of chess. And um, but the funny thing is, you know, when you wrestle that guy at the first of the season, and when I was going to school, you know, you didn't have school, or you didn't have wrestling. Uh, in younger grades now you can start with my son started wrestling at five years old mm. you know um but like ninth grade was when you started so i would be i was i wrestled weight class 103 i didn't even weigh 103 pounds but i was wrestling guys that were experienced at that at that weight class and i would wrestle them at the beginning of the year and i remember when i wrestled them again at the end of the year i was a total different person right you know and so that that showed me that it's not necessarily brawn and strength is what you know and how you are able to use what you know at the right time. So it's re- literally a game of chess to me. So what'd you do? You found a wrestling school? You found uh, the Hardys or did you come together? I, I was actually at a video store and one of the wrestlers there was passing out posters to a local show. And I said, hey, you know, I wrestled all the way through high school. And at this time, I, I literally weighed 125 pounds. Mm-hmm. And I said, hey, you know, I want to be a wrestler. He looked at me and laughed. And he told me where they met at. And, Can I uh, stop you before this, though? Yeah. W- were you on a search to become a wrestler? Was this no. something you wanted to do? Did It, li- it literally just sparked just, you the second he... When you see... Because, re- like, I had graduated from high school. I just graduated from high school. And, like, I wrestled all the way through school. So wrestling was pretty much all I knew. Yeah. And so when, he, when I saw the wrestling poster, I was like... What are you talking about? Y'all wrestle like y'all really wrestle like in a wrestling ring. So you didn't know that was a thing. I did not. I did not. And um and he was like, Yeah, and he did I'm so and so. I think his name was Commando uh or something. <laughs> and and like he was like, Yeah, I do so and so and this. And I was so intrigued and I was like, Well, where do y'all train at? And um and he was like, so and so. So I went there and like uh it was Matt and Jeff and I didn't know him at the time or whatever. And they was like, you know, well, can you wrestle? And I was like, Yeah, I, I could beat anybody in here. I'm I'm good and like I actually. This is did, the opposite. So yeah. you went in there thinking it would be Matt. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Uh, well, I <laughs> knew I knew on. it was gonna be the things, but I thought I already had the basics of pro wrestling down because of yeah. Matt wrestling. But they was like, no, we need you to fall and take this bump and don't protect yourself and don't. And Matt has a story in his book of how like it took me forever to take my first bump because I was like, okay, I need to tuck and roll. I need to do this. I need to you know absorb impact and all this type of stuff. And he was like, no, we just need you to bump. <laughs> Stay there. <laughs> right. Oh, whatever. So I had to kind of relearn some stuff, but it, I was at an advantage oh, to So you were one of those guys where they're like, this guy will never make it. Yeah. He can't no. even learn how to, like, yeah. actually, I, maybe if if it was like that, they didn't tell me. Yeah. They was just like, oh, uh, I'm telling you right now, yeah, Caprice. Yeah. <laughs> but I know because I was small and they had uh, Shannon Moore there, Shannon Moore was kind of like their, their, their small guy. They was like, well, we already got the small guy. It was like, we need a referee. 
And I was like, well, hey, you know, I can't really pay you to train, but I'll referee your shows for free. So that's how I pay for my training. I would go with them and I referee. That's a for, pretty for good yeah. deal. Yeah. And because I, there's people who pay now and then still referee for free. Yeah. Because that's part of their dues. Yeah. So I, you, you scored some free training. Yeah. And um, I, I guess I did. Because, but I would go up and down the road with them and I would, you know, uh, and even on the shows and all that. And we would just out referee their matches. And during that time, uh, and I don't even know how long I did that. Maybe a year. Um, I went from 125 pounds to like 160, and then Matt looked at me one day and he said, "I think you're ready," and they started using me ever since. Um, and I, I know that you were a pastor, are a pastor, or are or were. Uh, I would say I'm, I'm still a minister. Okay. I, I don't have any pastoral duties right now. I'm a minister at, at my church now. Um, were you in the in the military? I did contract work for the military. Ooh, yeah. What does that and, mean? You uh, <laughs> yeah, I was a contractor <laughs> for the military, and they called me on certain missions. Now, now um, it was kind of like overseas jobs, and I, I did was you looking. basic training and all that stuff? You had to go to a school to uh, basically know the area you're going into, but it's not like push-ups and all that. It's just more of knowledge okay. uh, uh, than anything so, else. So, my, I mean, my main question is, and you can tell me how you – so the idea of like, I, you know, as an independent wrestler, I was kind of like – and I, I don't know if you were too, but I was like, I, this is my path. You know, I went to college also, but I was always like, I wanted to be a pro, pro wrestler. I wanted to do the indies as much as possible. And then I never under like you found all this time to kind of do other stuff along with it. And then also maybe also have a job and then maybe also raise a family too. I think all, I think uh, the bottom line on that man is that loyalty has been my best friend and worst enemy. Um, because I was doing all these things, but like you, like we was talking about in a, in a conversation earlier, I've I've uh, been a you know uh, a jack of all trades and master of nothing. And I think the thing that I I I fault myself on is that when I was doing all these things, I never just did one thing. Mm -hmm. And because uh, I never just did wrestling, just did passage, just did. I was always doing this, that, and that. You know, nothing just, you know, ignited for me. And I and for a long time, I felt uh, a lot of ignorance with, with wrestling. Like I said, I always thought Omega was the big thing. And then when I went to Wild Side, I thought oh, Wild Side was the next big thing, you know, uh, or whatever, even though there was no money involved. And I, uh, I just thought like one day, you know, they're going to WWE is going to buy us and we're going to be up there, you know, you know, whatever, you know. And so uh, so me learning those ropes, but I never like just solely sold out and it was like, all I'm gonna do is wrestle. All I'm gonna do is that, and that's why when I talk to guys now, when I when I get a chance to mentor guys like Cedric Alexander and all that, you know, he was sold out that he didn't want to do anything else. Right. Everything he did, circumference wrestling, you know. And I was like, well, he, you're gonna make it, you know, because he had it in in every he worked at high spots. Everything he did had something to wrestling do with wrestling. Centric. Wrestling centric, exactly. Yeah. So you and would so, do the shows on the weekend, and then what? You would go to like I don't know. Oh, I worked in the school. Like, I, no, I worked in the. I worked. In, I went to college. I went to college. I graduated with a manufacturing engineering degree, um, and I worked in a factory. I was a plant supervisor for years. Uh, youngest plant supervisor there. It was crazy because I was like 20, 21 years old, and I was having people working for me in their 40s and 50s and stuff. And uh, But, like, you know, I was I worked in the factories for a long time, and then it got to a point to where my wrestling schedule, um, there was like, you got to make a choice. Um, or whatever so I could no longer hold a quote unquote nine to five job mm. and so after I got my degree I was like well I got a degree so I can go back into this anytime so I started kind of like finding jobs where I can make my own hours working for myself and stuff Oh, you, and, to uh, support your wrestling right habit, right. right as Tracy Smothers would yeah say. and I and I but it, it worked out because I had a friend that had his own business that needed help and I always had friends that was like hey man you know just work for me and I was able to do it um, to, to work these jobs where I can make good money and then be off whenever I needed to to go wrestle. And where does the church come from? Sorry. Uh, no. Where, I, where does I, the pastorness come from? Uh, I was called when I was 14 years old. I was called to preach. And I mean, uh, I guess that's self explanatory. No, it's no, not. It's what not. does that okay. mean? Call to preach is kind of like some people are like, I'm going to be a pastor when I grow up. Nobody's really like that. Um, it, it's just like called. It's like, you know, it's the feeling that God is calling you that. You need to be a pastor, and I would have dreams about it. I would have visions and and, and all. I had this one vision that really sticks out to me that I was <clears throat> I was on the road, and there was this guy in the middle of the road, and there were cars coming, 
And everybody was yelling at him, man, get out the road, get out the road. You're going to get killed. You're going to get killed. And he couldn't understand what they were saying. And he didn't understand nobody until I said, hey, you need to get out the road. And that's all I said. <laughs> and he got out the road, you know, and it was like the spirit said, there are some people that can hear pastor all day long and they're not going to understand a word they say until they hear you say it. You know, and I really feel that all pastors pretty much have the same message, but they just have to hear it from the right person for the person to understand it, for them to be able to apply it to their lives. And that's where I feel my calling is. I'm not going to be one of these deep worded and real deep and all this. I, I speak your language. I go to where you are. And even even in wrestling, I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm able to be a light because I don't have to carry a Bible everywhere I go. I live the life and people see that, you know, as a Christian, that I'm not just Bible Bible bashing and judging person or whatever I, I you love people, you know, and after you love people, they become curious about the love that you have for people. And that's when you can, you know, show them who you are. And if they become more curious, then that's on them. Uh, but but so you get that vision at 14. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I'm kind of curious, I guess, in the sense of let's relate it to independent wrestling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, do, is there are you getting bookings? Are you part of no, the no, no, church? No. OK, I told my I, I went to my pastor and I, I told my pastor. Uh, well, and he was like, yeah, he said you're being called a preacher. So he kind of took me on his wing. And, and uh, this was it. So he was, was he was your trainer. Yeah. And, yeah. You paid, you paid yeah, $10, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> and, uh, and he he said, well, you're going to start working the bus route. So what I did was I started working the bus route, which was like, you know, the, the bus that goes, brings people to church every morning or whatever. And I would preach on the bus. Like once we got all the kids on the bus. As like a 15 year old? Yeah. Was that normal? Or are you, a, uh, are you like a young prodigy? I don't know. I mean, was there, is that a normal thing that 16, 15? -year -old I didn't know were? any other, I didn't know any others, but like, that's kind of how I grew. Everybody just knew me as like the, the preacher kid, you know? Okay. And like, so I, I didn't know to know if I was, I didn't know. I mean, I never thought about it, you know. Um, that's just who I was. I just knew who I was. And so it was like, hey, that's, you know, that's so-and-so. He's a preacher. You know, really? That kid? Yeah. You know? And so um, so at 14 or whatever, I did, and then uh, as I got older, uh, we moved uh, again. And I started going to uh, another church, and the pastor from, the pastor that pretty much, you know, trained me or whatever, spoke to my pastor that I was going to and so that pastor kind of took me under his wing pastor Hare, and and he was more of a father figure uh to me and um and then like after that I did some schooling and just I grew up in the church there and I became like assistant pastor there and it's where I got most of my pastoral duties from and I actually had my own service where I did pastor yeah uh, so you did sermons and stuff yeah I did so every Sunday so are these like <laughs> I mean, I'm not being. Bro, go, just talk. But I'm saying man. I'm not being a shithead. Yeah, I'm saying, like, yeah. are these like promos? Are you like, uh, are you thinking about these nightmares before? Is it just what comes out? Do you, is there a, uh, is there a psychology like wrestling? Right, right. right. I'm Every, being, like, everybody's <laughs> different. Every, and I, that's a good question. I want to I mean, know, how, but I want to know how you yeah, yeah. saw it. Uh, the, the, it was different uh, for me. It was like uh, the way I was trained is, you know, you you kind of see your audience or whatever, and and then you just pray, and. And if you're going to preach at a place like at a time, one place you're only going to be there, a lot of times you could, you, you know, got to lay something on your heart and you start studying it and you go from this place to that place and you find out. And they are like, for me at the beginning, I was the three point preacher. You know, I would have like, I'm talking about faith and now I had three points about faith to talk about. And then you have your skeleton just like, like an imagine, and then you just kind of whatever happens after that skeleton, you know, if you, the Bible says study to show yourself approved. So I would still, I still kind of write out a sermon with bullet points. I have a point and I have bullet points, point bullet points, and I have like a conclusion uh, or whatever like that. And I would study that. But then like when you go up to preach, a lot of times it just blurs and you just you go and you're preaching what you studied and then when you when you you know when you finish because like it stops just flowing yeah you know and then you just stop because if you keep going on after that you're kind of just like entertaining yourself right you know what i mean and so <laughs> uh, it, yeah literally and, well, it, and, and, it seems to apply a lot to wrestling and i want to yeah. say like then those have gotten to like helped you in wrestling yeah that that's that is the thing at Wild Side that I feel that set me apart. Cause like I said, when I got to Wild Side, it was you know, uh, K Crush and, and AJ Styles and JC Daz and and Laz and all these guys that were just as athletic as I was, and um and I was like, man, what's different? And, and they were cutting promos, and it was like, all right, it's time we're gonna put you in a series with uh, Jimmy Rave, and it was like you cut a promo on it, and I was like, okay. And I just started talking, and it was like, 
what? <laughs> they didn't and, know. They and didn't the, know. yeah, and I, yeah, I didn't know. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. I just, I just like told, talked about what was going on and how I felt. And um, and like they, they liked it, and then I started adding like catchphrases and stuff like that. And then it just like picked up from there. And um, I've always been comfortable with talking, and uh, I guess as you can tell. And so it just they weren't used to it. Mm. But I kind of feel everybody. A, 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 a lot of times I feel that the gifts that I have when I was younger, I just thought everybody had them. Yeah. But I didn't know there was anything different about the way that I talked, debated, or walked, or whatever like that. Because it was just who I was, and I just thought everybody was who they were. Mm. So I wasn't like, well, I'm better at this than they are. I'm better. That's why when I looked at half, I was like, oh, they fly just like I do. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I was like, we're all the same, so I have to do something different. I thought it was like, it, it's not in the same way, but I thought... Like my love of wrestling was different than everybody that I grew up around. Mm -hmm. But I was like, once I get to wrestling school, it's gonna be full of people obsessed like me, and they're all gonna be amazing. Yeah. So like, I was worried, and then you know, you get there and you realize like, oh, these people are just <laughs> yeah, a lot of them they're just there. Like, yeah. why are you here? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then you're like, oh, because of my obsession of wrestling as a child, mm -hmm. and like the idea of finding out this niche school in the middle of Chicago that you know you assume that a million people are coming, but it's just right. Two it's trainers. just you. Yes, yes. Two trainers trying like. Begging for how people to get how people. can we get people? Yeah, yeah. I've rented this place and yeah. no one's coming. Yeah. And, and I Pay think you do. I think the world's gonna be there because yeah. everyone's gonna want to be a wrestler. It's the greatest thing. You're right. And I think that I pay that to you know when I grew up watching wrestling. I was watching like it's from a kid. And as I got older, um, my friends who were friends because we all were like wrestling. They kind of grew out of it. Mm -hmm. And I went from being this huge wrestling fan all the way to school to being like a closet wrestling fan. Mm -hmm. Where like, you know, my friends even became younger because like I would after work, because like I had a job in high school, I would go to their house and watch Monday Night Raw and, you know, or whatever like that. I would hang out with adults, but I would go over to my high school, you know, freshman friend's house to watch Monday because I didn't have cable, mm -hmm. you know, to watch wrestling. And they'd be like, oh, where are you going? Oh, man, I was going to hang with one of the boys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I had some and, of those too, it, man. It's it funny. And it was like, you know, I was watching wrestling. and uh, You find the ones, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. It's such and, a weird um, circle. And it was a big thing, man, to me, like to, to watch Monday Night Raw and, and Nitro and that whole big build and, and all that, man. I was into it, man. I was into it. So 15, 16 something years into your career, you finally catch a break with Ring of Honor. Mm -hmm. We wrestle each other. Mm -hmm. They liked you. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. You caught on. Um, because a lot of people will and still do, and you see it now for the past four or five years, mm -hmm. that there's people always coming in trying to get a job. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was that, do you, in your head, was that like a big change or... Because I know you talk so highly of Wildside, you were probably like, "Well, that was the big change," or you know, like or all of these breaks that you had. Yeah, or did you realize like, something I, I, about I'm it? Not, I, even now, I feel Ring of Honor is you know the the big deal. You know, when I talk to people and they say, "Hey, you you're still wrestling?" I'm like, "Yeah." Well, where do you wrestle? Because I'm from North Carolina, so when I when they find out about wrestling, well, where do you wrestle at? And, and showing in the same, they always say the same city. Like I'm, you know, you know big man small town type deal you know and i'm like no i wrestle for ring of honor and they're like really uh and they just brush it off well, you think about going to wwe and i'm like oh, man, ring of honor is yeah. like the you know third largest promotion in america and they're like oh that's that's good but that nxt is really you know what i'm saying yeah. and, and it's like they don't get it so i just really i don't talk about it as much but you i mean i'm just saying for you though mm -hmm. you weren't getting flown around the country before no 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 so when that when it happened with uh, every once in a while because like because of NWA Wildside, I, I got uh, picked up by this company called uh, Christian Wrestling Federation that, that AJ Styles put in a good word for me. And um, we would fly to, like, Texas and okay. different places like that. Um, so Was that DiBiase's one or a different one? It was a different one. Okay. It's actually the 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 original. They're still going now, uh, Christian Wrestling, out of Dallas, Dallas Texas. And I, I still work with them now. And Jay Rezzo is the owner of that no no uh the, the owner is uh, that was rob, a, that was rob a christian Bond. joke that was a christian joke oh okay <laughs> <laughs> but uh but no nah, he uh rob vaughn or whatever and like so i was i was kind of used to flying a little bit but like even with ring of honor i wasn't flying yet you know i, I had to, i was used to driving as well 
you know, so uh, it didn't matter to me. If I got a plane ticket, it was a big deal because I would never take it off my bag just so when you go into other indies, they're like, oh, this guy gets flown. He's a flyer. He's a flyer. He's flown around. Yeah, he's, fly- yeah, he's important. <laughs> I was told to do that. It was like, oh, never, don't even take that off, you know. So now when I go in the locker room, it's like, and I see guys with their thing on there. I'm like, you know, you could take that off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you you know the feeling that you have. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, so, I'll do that too. Sometimes yeah. I'll be like, look at this asshole, like yeah. wearing his Ribera jacket yeah. or whatever. But then, you know, sometimes you're like, yeah, I remember my I first remember time. it. You know, and you respect, and, and it's, a, it's a pride, it's a level, you know. So when I got to Ring of Honor and was accepted to be good enough to, you know, get a job, I was humbled. Because, like I said, you know, you're saying, you know, uh, 15 years into the business. But r- before that, you know, I was talking to other companies and they were huge on me and wanting to bring me in. But when they found out my age, it was like mm. pump the brakes. Mm. So in a way, I was hearing pump the brakes from them. And then I had been married. I've been married for 13 years now, but I had just gotten married. And, you know, my wife was kind of like, hey. What's going on? What we're gonna do with this? Is this is this ever gonna be a thing, or is this gonna just be a hobby? How serious are you about it? And so it, it was one of those uh, times in life to where I had actually just got back in country from Kuwait to wrestle because I was like, man, I just want to wrestle, you know. And and when I came back in country, doing military stuff the, with the contract, yeah, was, yeah. And so um, I, I had been there three years, and my wife was getting homesick, and I was kind of I was getting wrestling sick. Cause I had started wrestling in Kuwait. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I go to Qatar next month, uh, April twenty eighth. I go to Qatar and I'll be wrestling there. I'm like, I'm like the king of ladders champion for Qatar Wrestling Federation, uh, uh, Qatar Pro Wrestling, and they bring big guys over there. They have Sting and Booker T and Carlito and all these guys uh, and all. So, but like, uh, they started wrestling and I, a wrestling thing over in Kuwait, and I joined up with them, and I just got the bug, man. I was like, I gotta get back to the states. To wrestling when i got back here i went right back to uh, nwa which was anarchy at the time and i think ring of honor got word that i was back mm. and, and somebody there um they got with, in touch with bill barons and they was like you know can he still go you know and they was like and bill was like yeah he's pretty good and uh so that's when i they sent me gave, gave me the tryout matches with you and i had red titus and i had like like, like three or four like shows they had me on like back to back to back mm-hmm. to test me out and then it was like okay and then that's when they talked to me and said hey you know do you feel like you can hold a full load i was like lord yes <laughs> <laughs> and so that's kind of where it, you know picked up from there and then they told me what they wanted um and that was with the cedric alexander thing where they kind of had a, a mentor retype role they wanted me to play um or whatever and i was like hey i just want a job right you know, and then uh, I had knew Cedric from North Carolina, and I, and uh, but our relationship was kind of funny because it was like when we knew him, I would when I knew him, I knew him from like wrestling seminars, and I would always be like, hey man, you know, go across the room because they see us standing beside each other, they're gonna make us a tag team, right. and so we right. would, we would always pick about that, you know, and then so when I got the phone call about you know we got you tagging with this guy, da 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 da. Cedric Alexander. So when we first called each other, we just laughed about it because yeah. we knew eventually it was going to happen, <laughs> and and uh, and we had great chemistry. Still do. So it just went on from there. Cool. Uh, are you are you on the internet? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Social media. Oh, you're uh, on Facebook, and you told me you had yeah. a video go viral, and we're going to do a video, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got to do it, man, because you just said this podcast this morning, and we jumped on it. So it's on me to jump on the video. Right. So I'm on uh, at Twitter Caprice Coleman. Uh, Facebook Caprice Coleman. I have a page there, and every uh, Instagram Caprice Coleman. So yeah, it's e- I'm easy to get in contact with. Easy to get in contact. Easy to get in contact with. Yeah. And uh, are you rest? Are you just Ring of Honor? Or do you do other indies and stuff? I do other indies. Um, I my I am allowed to to do as long as it's not like TV based or, mm-hmm. or whatever like that. I'm allowed to do it. Uh, other shows, and so uh, I like to travel. I like to do whatever. I'm, I'm trying to feed the family, man. And right. God has given me a great outlet to be able to do so. My my greatest uh, thing I love to do, man, I love it when I'm booked in towns to wrestle and I'm booked that Sunday to preach at a church. Oh, you That's double near. dip. Oh, man. It's, you double dip. It's, it's double duties, man. <laughs> it's double talents. It's, 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 it's awesome. So. And you and you told me the kid who's 12. Yeah, my son. Yeah. He's, he's getting. He's going to get in there. <sighs> He's gonna in be six years. Is he gonna be on this podcast? You know what? I'm trying to talk him out of it. Really? Honestly, I am because like he has so much talent. 
He can be whatever he wants to be. He, he's 12 years old. He was like one of the youngest admitted to the School of Arts that he's in now. And he's doing great uh, in, in the studies and all. And like he, he's a drama major at 12, you know, and uh, he loves wrestling, but he, he loves acting as well. And, um, and so he comes to train. It's kind of like quality time type thing. And he's phenomenal at it. But, like, I'm like, man, you know, there's so many other things you can do, like, with what he's capable of doing. He could be a star and and do his own stunts and do, like, a movie every three years and make way more than, <laughs> you know? And so I feel like whatever he gets into, he'll do. At, at the beginning, I really thought he was going to be, wanted to be wrestler because of his dad. You know what I mean? Yeah. But he really has a genuine love for it. He loves it. He loves every aspect of it. He, like, uh, him and Jeff are, like, really tight. And Jeff Jarrett? Jeff Hardy. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I'm sorry. And, and so, like, and uh, Caleb Conley believes it. It's like they, he's got it, man. It's, it's a really um, – he has – he's naturally gifted in stuff that I've trained to do. And, like, right. but he – he could sing, he could dance. He he just he just got all of it, man. He's he's good. I look forward to seeing. Yeah. So I, I don't care about you anymore. I look forward hey, to seeing how your kid. Hey man, progresses. you know I really feel that we are put on earth to to make you know to make an impact, but our impact is worth nothing if our if our offspring can't make a bigger impact. And so you have to be able to plant seeds, and you have to be able to leave a legacy behind to where your legacy is greater than what you were. So that well, that's uh that's, that's what I want to do. I appreciate that. Yeah. And it also means I'm fucked. So. <laughs> <laughs> man, I'm just talking about me, man. I'm just talking about me. You gotta do what you gotta do, but uh, I know what I gotta do. So <laughs> I gotta leave something behind for mine, you know? All right, Caprice. Thanks for coming on, man. Uh, thanks for having me. Caprice and I did a YouTube video or a Facebook video on his Facebook, but he, I think he put it up on YouTube. But go check his Facebook where he confronted me about being Jewish. And then he told me he loved me. And I love you too, Caprice Coleman. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you, everybody, for listening to the show. Before we get out of here, let's get into some plugs and... Upcoming events! All right, the best way that you can support ColtMerge.com, DigitalColt.com. That's where you can buy the Wrestling Road Diaries 3, Twitter and Instagram, at Colt Cabana, Facebook slash AOW Podcast, also slash Colt Cabana. My storytelling podcast, Pro Wrestling Fringe, plus past archives of this show are ad-free, and they're on Howl.fm slash Colt. Use that code Colt. Get yourself a free month. ColtWrestling at gmail.com is my very public email. Maybe a promoter won't put me on your upcoming show or convention. I have a YouTube channel. I'm always putting up some videos. ColtCabana.com is my website. I got a P.O. box there. I love getting snail mail. Upcoming Thursday, tonight, if you're listening, April 20th, Cape Breton, Canada. Facebook slash ACWA Wrestling. Saturday, April 22nd, Cape Girardeau. It's the weekend of capes. That's in Missouri. CapeWrestling.com. Friday, April 28th. Saturday, April 29th, Milwaukee and Minnesota. ROHWrestling.com. Sunday, April 30th, Austin, Texas. WrestleCircus.com. Friday, May 5th, Clive, Iowa. ProWrestlingRevolver.com. Saturday, May 6th, Chicago, Illinois. A free podcast taping at Brick Brack Records in Logan Square at 4 p.m. And then doors open at 6 p.m. for that night at the Logan Auditorium. AAWrestling.com. Sunday, May 7th, and Wednesday, May 10th, Toronto and Detroit, ROHwrestling.com. I also believe I'm doing commentary Friday, May 12th, and Sunday, May 14th, New York City and Philadelphia, ROHwrestling.com. Saturday, May 13th, Westbrook, Maine, LimitlessWrestling.com. Friday, May 19th, Lakewood, Ohio, Old with an E, Wrestling.com. Matt Classic will be there. Also, Colt Cabana will be there. Saturday, May 20th, Rahway, New Jersey, WrestlePro Online. Dot com. Those are the dates. That is the show for this week. Huge thank you to you guys at home for listening, telling a friend, taking it in. Thanks to Caprice Coleman for coming on the show. Thanks to Cable Guy Jeff and Stu Stone, Kid Russell, and Matt Jenkins on the music. Dane Miller helped me with tech. Highspots.com are a sponsor. They have a VOD service. That's where you can watch your PWGs and all the great independent wrestling out there. You can also get AMA knee pads, gear, mask, a wrestling ring. OneHourTees.com. They help run ProWrestlingCrate.com. They help run ProWrestlingTees.com. And that's where you can support your favorite independent wrestler. TweakedAudio.com slash Colt. The earbuds that I use get over 30% off of free shipping just because you listen to this show. And that's the show. That's the show for this week. But you can uh, tweak Caprice and let him know you like the show. I think we're on a, I think we're on a bit of a roll, having some good shows, enjoying the stuff that I'm putting out. 
Enjoying. I'm enjoying. All right. This has been The Art of Wrestling. For Colt Cabana, I'm Colt Cabana. Thanks. What would the Lord say about professional wrestling? Uh, there is a verse that say, I've become all things um, to all people so that through all things they may know me. So if he's using me to be in wrestling as a vessel to bring people to him, then that's a part of me becoming all things for him. Caprice Coleman, 413. There you go. <laughs>